Hello humans, hello humans. Not much time today. We need to get um, some stuff uh, through some stuff here. So today is the 2nd of September 2022. Um, we're going to discuss some history, but basically we're discussing the paradigm of law. Okay, so uh, Virtually everybody who watches this video can consider themselves a prawn, all right? Not a pawn, like in um, Game of Chess, but a prawn, like one of these uh, shrimps that, that uh, swims in the ocean and is, and is harvested by all the whales when there's enough of them to swim by and, and eat them, okay? And um, we're in a situation now where within, and it's unrecognized, all right, so let me back up a little bit. This is this is complicated, okay? Complicated simply means there's a lot of parts that are interconnected. Each individual part may be very simple. Doesn't mean that the whole thing is complex, just simply lots of parts, lots of layers. We're going to talk about law today. Um, I have an insight that may be valid, and we'll see over time if it is, and this insight um, is that I think I know why uh, the uh, law of manual was updated in, in 2016. Bear in mind that uh, it was updated in 2016. The manual was reproduced with all the changes and everything, meaning that they'd been working for some time in getting it uh, to that point that they could put it all to print and, and get it updated and put it out there. And so here's the thing. Um, the United States uh, is, is, okay, so these states united is different from the United States. And we have a situation here where there are two nations on this continent. We have the nation of uh, all of the states, we have the nation of all of the states here. I don't think that's going to work. Let me get some serious magnets. I don't think I need all of those either. Okay. So we have the union of the 48 continental states. And then we have uh, D.C. over here, right? Uh, right there. So there's Washington, D.C. Now, there are two separate nations in this country. This one over here, you're not taught this in your history. They deliberately do not tell you this uh, because it affects law. It affects how you are governed and what law you're actually operating under when you get into a court uh, or when you have to do things. And it is um, necessary that you understand at least some of the background here as to why we get to this point, right? And... Uh, there are a lot of moving parts. I'm just going to concentrate. It's just going to take us very rapidly up to a certain point, and then we can go into some detail, okay? Uh, there is a flaw in the Constitution. The flaw in the Constitution allowed these two nations to be created. One is these states united on the North American continent, and the other is the United States an incorporation entity in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. will never, ever, ever become a state. All right? I know this for a fact. When it becomes a state, if it ever were to become a state, we would not have the, the political structure that we have here now. And there's a reason that I state this. The reason is that we have two republics, or two, two nations here. Um, we have a, a constitutional... Uh, republic that is the union of all of these states and then we have a, a democracy that is Washington DC that's why um, uh, we'll get into that in a second okay what allows this to occur is this article 1 section 3 clause 17 it's a flaw in the Constitution that clause gives this territory and all federal territories, uh, it gives control of them to the legislature, to the fucking Congress. No executive, 
uh, branch control um, and no judicial branch control at all. The legislature is 100% in charge of Washington, D.C., and Guam and Puerto Rico and the federal territories that uh, exist. Um, so that's why they say, that's why the Democrats say Trump is a threat to our democracy. All right. They're talking about the legislative democracy that exists here that is not a constitutional republic. The people that live within this territory, Puerto Rico, Guam, Washington, D.C., all of the territories that the federal government uh, nominally owns, those people are subjects of the legislative branch of our constitutional republic. So they are actually resident serfs. Okay, they're not citizens of the continental United States. They're not citizens of any of the Union states. They are citizens, which is to say in this text, in this context, they are subjects of the legislative authority that rules Washington, D.C. So we have two nations here on this, on this uh, continent. We have the, the Continental Republic, the Constitutional Republic, that was established on the continent, and then we have this territory of Washington, D.C. This territory is very much in the model of the Vatican and very much in the model of the city of London, which is not part of Great Britain, for instance, and is not uh, under the, the authority of the Queen. So we have that same situation here. They can do any fucking thing they want in Washington, D.C. Thus, you understand why Nancy Pelosi didn't want the National Guard there. That would be, she would be inviting a foreign force into her democracy. She would have been inviting um, an invading army. And an army from these continental um, uh, linked union of states. That, and so, you know, they, they didn't want that. That's why they're pumping up the Capitol Police Force to be their form of an um, uh, intelligence agency kind of thing and so on. Now, this is all coming back to the war we're in right now, which has so many different levels. And that I've been looking at all of these various different levels, and we'll have to get back into that at some other point. We're not going to go quite there today. What we are going to do is discuss how this came about and, and what is the next step, right? So we've had a situation here. This all, of course, is money and bankers, right? The, all of it goes back to the WEF, even though the WEF didn't exist at the time that this stuff started. So from 1760 to 1790, uh, 1789, when we were um, uh, notionally established, uh, we had a series of, we had some events here. We had the uh, revolutionaries borrow money to create the continental to create the 13 uh, uh, states union on the continent of America. They borrowed it from the French, from the French bankers, Rothschilds, etc. King George backed that debt, okay? And uh, it was uh, so he was backing both sides of the revolutionary. He couldn't lose no matter what happened. The British crown could not lose no matter what happened. Uh, they ended up in the in the catbird seat as they went along. Things have changed for them, and um, we've got um, I don't know which one is anyway. Um, and we've got <laughs> they didn't they didn't quite go to to their uh, to their liking, but nonetheless. So we borrowed six million dollars. We the revolutionaries borrowed six million dollars in order to create our nation and get it registered with all the other nations in 1789. That debt was due in 1790. That debt by then was actually $18 uh, million because they had continued to borrow money after 1776 through to 18, uh, 1789. Now, the original note had a, a seven-year term on it. So in other words, here's six million uh, gold coins to go, uh, six million um, Livre, I think they were called, uh, from the French, to go and have a revolution, and you'll owe us this much money uh, in seven years' time. Well, seven years' time came. We didn't have the money to pay them back, but they rolled the debt over, as bankers want to do, right? As they will always do. At that time, they took over the uh, part of the country uh, in the form of some little, little collaterals, right? And uh, we had a problem when we didn't make another payment in um, 1812, and we had Right, of 1812 was all about enforcing payments for the bankers uh, from the city of London. 
And they lost that one uh, because we've got some pretty good fighting people here. And it set them back. But nonetheless, the, the debt was rolled over from 18 million um, in gold coins. That's what we had to pay back. We didn't have the gold. Uh, anyway, and so during this period of time, from 1790 through to 1871, we were operating under common law that we'd inherited from uh, the British. This is also known as the law of the land. And we have title to the land, okay? Unlike most of the people that live in Europe who own property, like even a farmer in Europe does not own his land. Most of them don't own the land. What they have is um, uh, equitable title. They get to use that property, pass that right to use it onto their children, etc., etc., but they actually don't own the underlying land. This is why um, Klaus Schwab and the Weffers want to stop them being able to work the land, therefore that abrogates their contract and removes from them equitable title. And so uh, if they can't work the land, they can't have possession of it anymore, and he can come in and effectively kick them off with, without any real big deal because they don't own the underlying land. They just own the right to use it. So most of Europe is that way, that people don't actually own the property upon which their structures, houses, buildings, etc., their, their offices, their businesses are actually constructed. And that is not the case here in the United States. Here in, um, in Continental um, Union, we own the land title. And that really pisses off the mother weffers because they can't control us as serfs because we have the right to sit on our property, grow our own fucking food, and tell them to sit on it and spin. Whereas in Europe, you don't have that right, okay? Especially in England, where 97% of, the pro of all the, the land is owned by the crown and, and they say what happens on it. Um, Anyway, so we have a constitutional republic and, uh, um, uh, on, um, created in the, in the 1700s based on common law. But in, 17, or in 1871 was another period where we had to roll over the debt. The debt having ballooned seriously from $18 million to this point, and, and we can't pay it off, so we roll it over again. At that point, okay, so every single time we have to roll over the debt, the bankers come back and they have demands. In 1871, they wanted a new corporation established, and that was called the United States, Inc. And this corporation uh, is, uh, owns all of the land that the federal buildings are on, wherever those federal buildings may be. It owns the, it was given title to all federal territories in order that it might collect rent from our government in a way to get money from all of the people that live here without us having to know that we're actually paying a tribute to these foreign bankers. And, and, and then there's all the other issues of the other parts of the history about when they tried to establish central banks in, in this United States and all of these kind of things. Uh, because there's the banking, uh, there's actually layers of, of fighting in this between various different banks. So the central bank um, octopus is not monolithic. It's very much a fractured, factional kind of thing with lots of infighting. In, in any event, though, so in 1871, we get the United States, Inc. The United States, Inc. And that brings in equity law. Equity law, um, the difference is in common law, um, if you injure somebody or their property or, or deprive them of the property, you can stand up and sue them. And if you're being sued, there must be another party that can stand up and say, I've been aggrieved and damaged. That's the only way you can have uh, a lawsuit under common law. So uh, common law does not attempt to enforce contracts. Equitable, equitable law, equity law, does. Equity law attempts to compel uh, performance by providing uh, criminal penalties. We went into equity law, which was adjudicated within the courts as though it was Roman civil law, because in Roman civil law, there was a lot of, um, uh, also called Roman municipal law, there was a lot of stuff about enforcement of, of performance, about enforcing contracts. So anyway, um, 1871, we switch over to uh, equity law. Equity law does not supersede common law. It can go back to common law. It is based on common law. Most people never knew the difference. Uh, there was never really any uh, big 
brouhaha about it. There was a brief flurry of stuff in from 18 late 1860s up to the 1880s, but it had kind of passed out and settled out of the, the culture in the 1880s. Then anyway, along comes the tumultuous period uh, from the 1900s uh, with Teddy Roosevelt and all of that, the trust buster. He broke up a lot of the bankers' illegal operations here in the, United, in, in the, the Constitutional Republic. You have to be careful. You know, you got to start, if I say the United States, I'm actually referring to the incorporated uh, into, into the corporation. So these United States versus the United States. In any event, from 1900s um, up through 1935, we have huge amounts, or well, let's just make it 1938, uh, huge amounts of chaos in those 38 years, uh, all of it generated by the bankers. The reason that they were doing that was that they had a particular situation that was arising. That particular situation that had arisen was that the, okay, so initially we get a term of seven years on our loan, and then that gets rolled over. Once we're a nation, the term is 70 years. So you get 70 years on your, on your term. And so um, the 70 year deadline from the 1790 period is coincidentally um, 1861, in which we get the between Abraham Lincoln and the bankers, because the bankers wanted Lincoln to do certain things like split the country up, turn the land titles back over to them, um, all different kinds of things. And Lincoln said, fuck no. Um, and so the bankers occupied the South. They pumped in all kinds of money to uh, create the slave uh, industry. At that point, they really burst it out, in, you know, in terms of uh, moving people over like mad uh, from like 1853 up to about 1858. In five year period of time, they moved over more slaves than they had in the previous 15 years. It was just a, a rush. They knew shit was happening. Uh, they had expected something to occur in 1861 due to the um, uh, uh, their knowledge of the situation and the banking and so on. Lincoln uh, fucked them over, kept the country whole, caused all kinds of problems, set all kinds of precedents uh, legally, but he kept the country as a single unit with the land title. Okay, none of the land title passed out to him until 1871. Uh, in 1871, they got official that we had to create a new the United States Inc. and we had to give it land title uh, to everything the federal government uh, nominally owned. The federal buildings, the monuments, all of this kind of shit. Um, and so that they could collect uh, rent on it. Now, in this period of time here, from the 1900s to, the, to 1938, they were creating the same kind of chaotic conditions that they tried to create in the 1850s, and it didn't quite work. Here, here it worked, and they got a global war, because in this period of time, we were supposed to have another rollover, and in, eight, in 1938, um, we effectively, because of World War II, and, the, and it's, it's really goofy to think about it because we had so much in the way of gold and cash reserves and all of this, but in, in 1930, at the end of World War II, in, in 1947, we had all of that, but in, in 1938, our country was officially bankrupted, okay, officially. Like, the bankers said, you guys are all bankrupt, we're going to come in and seize the country. We're going to take the land title, take the title to all the land in the continent. United States, Alaska, Hawaii, and, and add it to our, the title that we have for Washington, D.C., and there will be a dissolution. They were going to try and do this in the 1930s, and there will be a dissolution of the common law, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. You just won't have it anymore because you're all going to be our serfs because we're going to own all the land. Well, okay, so when that occurred, uh, they realized they had a real problem. And that real problem was that, um, the bankers, I mean, and that was that there was just too much in the way of weapons here in the United States, uh, in, in these United States, the, the populace, USA populace, um, had just too well armed. And they did not, the bankers did not have an army of their own. 
So in order to come on in and enforce their uh, claim for bankruptcy. Now, bear in mind, a lot of their claim for bankruptcy is all based on fraud. All right. A lot of their shit is based on fraud. Thus, the contracts that they're attempting to enforce, if you if you dispute them, you can prove the contract was entered into in a fraudulent way and therefore is not valid. But if you if you're ignorant and you don't dispute them, then the courts will necessarily try and enforce it on you. So. In, um, in 1938, let's shove the, the continent over there. Uh oh, tectonic plate movement. Okay, so in 1938, we have another bankruptcy. Okay, this one is the final one, as far as they're concerned, right? Our bankruptcy here in 1938, they could not seize the property, they couldn't seize the territory. They had to do something, so they got us to roll over the debt one more time by bankrolling World War II. And in World War II, we capture all kinds of gold, we get all kinds of federal territories, Guam, etc. And so we get all these new assets. And so at that point, the bankers are eh, mollified. Okay, they can get more rent, they've got more uh, money coming in. They, in the 1930s, they get the IRS so that they can enforce their um, claims. The IRS, by the way, uh, the laws operating or, or authorizing the IRS state that it can it only is it's only valid in federal territory. So if you don't work for the federal government and you don't you're not a subject of the federal uh, democracy. That's why the Democrats keep saying our democracy because it's a legislative democracy that they control a hundred percent right now. Um, if you're not part of that, if you don't work for the federal government, you don't live in any federal territory, technically you don't have to deal with the IRS. There's a couple of good books, I'll put their ISBN um, numbers down. I cannot be seen, I have to be very careful with my language, I cannot in any way be seen to be offering legal advice in any way, shape or form, I'm just talking about history here, right? And uh, you can read these books and make decisions on your own. And they're little tiny books. They don't cost them very much, but they'll tweak your thinking. Anyway, so in World War II, uh, we get the, the IRS and we get a lot of gold. Now, the bankers in 1938, they decided that they had to replan what was going on. Okay, so we're going to move all of this here. So the being rolled over every 70 years, that's okay with them. They want us in. That's the whole point. But in 1938, we were 100% broke. And so they financed us again and got us to buy into yet another period. Of and in 1938, they swapped us over to a new kind of law. So in 1938, we go from equity, equity law in our courts, and we go into what was then known as admiralty law. also called uh, merchant law. In admiralty and merchant law, uh, that's all about enforcing contracts. It's all about international contracts. A lot of this stuff here, of course, does not pertain to any of your daily activities or getting sued and so on. If you know this, you can, if you know this information that I'm telling you right now, that the, our, our United States courts are being told to operate under admiralty law and merchant law, only they don't, they won't ever say that. What they call it is statutory, statutory law, enforcing statutes, not laws, okay? And so, because there's public policy, which are statutes, and there are tens of thousands of those, that's what our courts enforce. You can uh, opt out of this, and those books will show you how. When you get into a situation in court, you can basically force them, you can game them into honoring common law. Uh, through um, Uniform Commercial Code, uh, Volume 1, um, Section 308.4, you reserve your rights to uh, common law, um, Bill of Rights, etc. And then Uniform Commercial Code, Volume 1, 103, up through 104, shows you how to do um, redress, how to, to argue and uh, get uh, uh, rec 
recompensated for these kind of things. So we're operating under the Uniform Commercial Code is basically our law because Admiralty Law, Merchant Law, enforces commercial activities. They're calling it statutory law because they cannot afford to tell you that we were bankrupt and all of this because the bankers made, as part of the conditions of rolling over the debt, they made, that every, made it a secret that anybody participating in this cannot blab this stuff out to the public from officialdom because they don't want the public to revolt and take all of our guns and shoot anybody coming on in. The bankers actually plan to create chaos in such a manner that they can bring in their enforcement troops, who are the, the blue-helmeted uh, UN guys and NATO, uh, their One World Army, and they want to blend our army into their army so that they get One World Army, One World Court, and One World Government, which is the Mother Weffers, and all of us are their slaves. And that's their plan. Now, in order to accomplish that, they've got to get our guns. They have a plan here to get our guns. That plan was that they created, okay, so this flaw right here in the Constitution basically says that any federal territory is controlled 100% by the legislature. The legislature is God in that territory, can try people, can execute them, uh, can do any fucking thing it wants there, the Congress, right? And, and there's nothing you can do about it, and it is a democracy, which is mob rule. You've got a lot of Congress people uh, on your side. You own all the federal territories and all of that. That's why they're so afraid of Trump, because if Trump can get enough people elected, he can take over their democracy. Not the, the, not the Constitutional Republic, but their democracy headquartered in Washington, D.C. So, um, to get our guns, they create FEMA. All right, hang on. Which is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, right? Act and agency. Um, thus, what they did was to overlay across the United States, all of, uh, across the Continental Union, all of these federal regions. And I'm just drawing them very crudely to get you the idea. I live out in Region 10. I'm in Region X. Uh, by the way, note that it's Clause 17, very pertinent. Um, so uh, they get FEMA, and they control FEMA. It's a Federal Emergency Management Act. So here's the thing. Continuity of government is not devolution. Kerry Cassidy and those people that are pimping on, on continuity of government are disinformation sites. They're putting out shit that you don't want to know. Go, there's a couple of substacks. Uh, or well, you, you may want to know that you know they're pimping this bad information. Continuity of government is not a good thing. They use continuity of government. The bankers have used continuity of government since 1938 to maneuver us to where we are now, and they're trying to get the guns. Uh, they're going to declare. They want to declare things through the Federal Emergency uh, Management Agency, and then impose those things over all of the people here. Now, if you just assume that you're a citizen of the United States, then they have authority over you. But if you're a citizen of your state, I'm a citizen of the, of the state of Washington. I'm a, um, a lawful uh, resident. I'm a, I'm a citizen, uh, depending on how you define that term, of this state. I'm not a citizen of the United States. I have nothing to do with their fucking uh, corporation. And in fact, I am a foreign national uh, to their corporation. Uh, so I have nationality that's outside their, their corporation, and it is foreign to them. Uh, they have no authority over me. Anyway, so they're going to try and use FEMA to get away, get your guns the same way they use the equivalent of FEMA in Australia to get the guns there uh, with the assistance of the uh, media. They're not going to be able to do it because we're too ornery here. We're too paranoid. Uh, there's too many of us after the stuff that see this shit going down and uh, that are, are wise to it all. However, that's the approach they're going to use to try and get it so this is what's going to be building up in this period of the big ugly. Uh, they may indeed arrest Trump. That may be a necessary stage. But let me say something here real quick because I've got to go and do bread and other chores. Uh, I know, or I suspect that I know why the, the law was 
to return to our subject here, why it was updated specifically in, in 2016, and they started working on this in real seriousness in 2008. That was, the, of course, the banking crisis that prompted a lot of the people within the self-organizing collective to get off their ass and get moving in this particular direction. It had been ongoing for some period of time, but it really escalated them. This was in the works. They started it in 2008, and they come in and they, and they update it and print it out and put it out there in 2016 so that we would have a situation uh, or not have a situation that exists right now, okay? Uh, right now, if you go to, if you're in court, and you politely ask the judge to define the jurisdiction that, that, that you're under and, and you ask him in a particular way, they'll come back and they'll say statutory law. Now, I won my case against Corey. This is just an aside. I was sued by butthead Corey Good, uh, the great uh, um, time-traveling space retard. And, um, and I won, okay, because I challenged the jurisdiction. I challenged them at this level. And I put the judge in a bind. They either had to admit that they were operating under admiralty law or they had to give me the win. They gave me the win. Uh, because of the way that I had structured this, I'm not going to go into it. Anyway, so this is the thing. There is no rules of procedure for statutory law. They're operating without being able to provide you. You can find admiralty law rules of procedure. You can find all kinds of shit written about admiralty law, but they dare not say that that's the case. Um, so if you get into a court with a judge, you politely ask the judge to define where you are at in terms of what's the jurisdiction so that you can make a decision as to whether you're guilty or not guilty or how to proceed and so on. You need to understand how this thing works and they must provide it to you. If you don't understand, they cannot proceed. Uh, it's one of the requirements that, <laughs> that you have to acknowledge that you comprehend what the fuck's happening to you because it's a contract. So you have to willingly buy into the contract in order to willingly buy into it. You cannot be a mental deficient and you must understand the terms of the contract at least to the point where you can say that you willingly agree to them. Now, in order to do that in a court, you need to have what are known as the rules of procedure. And there are no rules of procedure for statutory law because statutory law is just merely a name-stealing um, action on the part of the legal structure, which is not necessarily lawful, to try and disguise the fact that they're operating under admiralty law enforced on them by the banks. Now, I'm here to tell you today that we're going to go through another one of these periods of time. It's not 1938, it's 2022. And we've been going through it since 20... 16 and it'll continue for another couple of years and what's happening here will not result in our guns being taken away nor fema although they'll try becoming uh preeminent and uh, the rule of the the so if fema ever comes in continuity of government ever comes in the constitution is suspended the congress need not meet get elected or anything like that they're all permanent from that point on and when they die they appoint their kids that sort of thing right so it's it's turning us into a, a kingdom at that point that's what fema is intended to do that's not going to happen because what's going to, I know from the clues, that what's going to, to happen here is that we are going to redress Clause 17, all right? And because I've seen the clues myself, we're going to have another one of these shifts. So we had a shift in, uh, uh, a major shift in 1871. We had another one there in 1790. These are shifts in the law. And we had another one in 1938 that has been the most egregious, getting us into this uh, bogus statutory law, right? Or admiralty. Uh, but we're going to have another one of these. And we're going to shift into the law. Of and this will continue for a number of years, okay? Because this will continue for a number of years because it's global. It's against an evil banking cartel and uh, their minions, and they've got a lot of those, millions of minions. And it's going to be a long, drawn-out thing. And when, it, and when you get into it, they did not want to have a situation where there was no rules of procedure. So you have here rules of procedure for <laughs> our next phase uh, in law, for our next shift into the law of war being dominant. So at some point, we will shift here, and um, there will be a different 
judiciary structure because our judiciary is captured. It's 100% controlled by uh, the, the, the democracy, not the constitutional republic. We don't have constitutional judges except in rare places, right? And the, the democracy shoots and kills as many constitutional judges as they can. That's why you'll see uh, judges, you know, drowned in lakes, um, accidents on the road, uh, you know, uh, themselves, all of this kind of stuff. It's because they're being murdered by the operatives of the democracy such that we will not have constitutional judges. And those judges that will remain are simply going to be admiralty judges, statutory judges that will reinforce the uh, and compel compliance to the contract that the bankers want to put on us fraudulently to return us to basically a kingdom with them as a collective king. And, um, and that's, that's what's happening now. That's what's going on now. And I think that we're in the process of swapping over into the law as all of this stuff emerges over these next couple of years. This will be the, the manual that you'll need to, to understand for um, all of your legal operations, for also state legislatures and so on. In, in 1871, the, when the bankers came on in, they took over the state capitals. All the buildings, all the property that the state government owns, they have to pay rent on to the bankers. They gave it as collateral. That was part of the federal government. The federal government, the democracy, tricked and has continued to trick the states since 1871 up through this point. Now you've got a lot of savvy state uh, legislators uh, that are there are state people, state nationals that are going to a, to attempt to get elected into their legislative position. So everything's up in the air. Everything's being uh, torn up in, in terms of the the social um, fabric, the social um, infrastructure. Okay, that being all torn up and stuff is what's part of the process of us shifting into a new form of law. And I can be guessing, and it can be wrong. But I'd like to see five years from now what kind of courts are operating and um, and how you have to address those courts and what you have to do in those courts, right? Because once the, uh, what, a lot of people, so you'll see people say the military is the only way, you know, which is true. Our, uh, the democracy exists. It's captured our our. Uh, constitutional uh, legislative body. It's captured our, our all of our institutions, the banks, the education, the justice department, and parts of the military. Well, they're saying, uh, some of these sites will say the military is the only way. The problem with that is, having been a military brat for 17 years and grown up in it and seen it and all of that, once the military comes on in, it's going to be there for a very, 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 very long time to sort out all of this stuff. A very long time. Not, not a year, not two years, but we're talking decades. That is why the manual was so thoroughly updated um, in 2016. Coincident with, and there you go, guys. So anyway, so that's my theory. And at this point, I'm sticking to it, right? Because I'm seeing more and more evidence. Now, I've got to go. There's all kinds of information that's been popping out about UFOs and all sorts of other things. I'll try and make another video if I can. Um, I'm very busy. I had, for instance, a brand new tire go flat on me trying to go in and get shopping the other day. Um, I'm 47 uh, miles away from the nearest repair place for that tire, so I got issues. I got to repair two tractors because the environment's so harsh out here. And... Um, I've got to build my biodigesters, and and we're working on the turbines for the for the electrical generation, and all of this kind of shit's going on. So it's difficult to get out here and make videos, many of which do need the whiteboard because we're getting into that period of time where you have complicated shit that you've got to draw a bunch of um, pictures to make people at least have a hope in hell of understanding what's going on. And that's it. <laughs> that's it. I really have to get back to work. So anyway, uh, stay woo. It's not going to be um, any less intense going forward. We're just starting into the, into the hump of the big ugly, and it's going to continue in until March or April of next year. And then we'll be able to have some level of clarity as to how things are proceeding. So anyway, stay woo, guys. <laughs>